Good morning, Living Rock Church, uh, wherever you are. I uh, want to thank you for joining us today. And uh, for those of you who are here, may we uh, request that you uh, please stand for, the, for our call to worship. It is found in Psalm, Psalm uh, 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's all have a um, minute of silence to uh, pray. Lord, we come before you, humbling ourselves. Truly, O oh Lord God, you are our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. You told us to cast all our cares and worries before thee, for you alone can give us peace amidst all the negativity and uncertainty that we are facing right now. As we remember and celebrate your birth this month, may we honor you, O oh Lord, in our life. May the life that we live every day be pleasing to Thee. May we be obedient to Your Word. Help us look beyond the gifts and gatherings, but we should look unto You as the author and finisher of our faith. We thank You, Jesus, for this opportunity that You have given us today, that we can come here together and praise Your name and worship You, Lord, in spirit and in truth. May You be blessed with every word that we say and every a song that we sing today and for the message that we will be list, uh, hearing today, Lord. We glorify you and we lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Scripture reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Would you join with me in reading these verses together? Now, therefore, thus as you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You may be seated. Would you join me in a prayer of confession? Lord, we um, want to quiet our souls this morning and approach you with reverence, which is what you deserve. Lord, your word declares that you are near to the brokenhearted. And so now, Lord, we, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would search us and know us and examine our thoughts and our hearts to see if there's any wicked way in us, if there's anyone that we've hurt this week or anyone that we've sinned against, if there's anything that we've done to grieve your Holy Spirit, if we've broken your law, Lord God, we ask that you would reveal that to us now. God, we thank you. As you revealed yourself to Moses, you said you are gracious, slow to anger, compassionate and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. And Lord, you do not treat us as our sins deserve, Lord. And so because of that, Lord, we ask that you'll forgive us, Lord, for Jesus' sake, Lord, that you would cleanse us, cleanse our hearts from sin, Cleanse us, Lord, from sinning against other people, Lord. Help us to get right with those people. Lord, thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, where would we be if you did not convict us, Lord? We would still be dead in our sins. So we thank you, Lord, for that. Because you love us and you care for us, you convict us, Lord. You're so faithful. So we, we ask now that you would forgive us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who declares that if we do confess our sins, you're faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we thank you for that. We thank you for the promise. We thank you for Jesus, the lamb who takes away our sin. We thank you for the child that was born who would save his people from their sin. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. We ask that you will be glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it? 
stand before your throne before the holy one of heaven it's only by your blood it's only through your mercy lord i come i bring an offering of worship to pray brothers and sisters father as we are gathered together on this first this December Sunday of 2020 may we be reminded that we are called to humbly bring an offering of worship to Jesus as our King and father at this time we'd like to pray for those in in our state of California who have been victims of, of identity theft and unemployment fraud during this pandemic year. Father, there are many people who do not have employment and work and they are really in desperate need of, of unemployment and help and they have been uh, just victims of terrible wickedness. And so Lord, we ask for peace and comfort for those who have been sinned against. Father, we pray that resources and provisions would be provided for all those who have been affected. And we ask, Lord, because you are a sovereign and good God, that justice against those who participated in this wickedness would come. And then people would realize what they have done wrong. And that there would be accountability against those who didn't provide the proper safeguards. Lord, we also ask that our church would rise up to serve and love anyone that we know who's been a victim of fraud. And Father, that we would just come alongside them and serve them and love them in Jesus' name. Lord God, we also at this time, though it might seem weird, we want to pray for the country of Mexico. Father, we lift up to you, President Obrador and other government leaders, to our neighbors to the south. Father, we ask, because this country of Mexico, they have been racked for many years by the power of the cartel. So we ask, Lord, because you're sovereign and good, that you would break the power of the drug cartels in Mexico so that their power and their influence would evaporate and go away. And Father, we ask for all of our brothers and sisters in Mexico that our fellow believers would function as salt and light to do good works to the praise of your name and that people would be saved out of the darkness of sin and evil there in Mexico. Lord God, also at this time, we want to pray for missionaries serving and working all over the world with the International Mission Board of the SBC. 
the denomination that our church family is a part of. Lord, we ask for safety and comfort and courage during these tumultuous days for our brothers and sisters all throughout the world. We pray for the IMB workers to remember and be encouraged that there is a denomination of over 47,000 churches that stand with them. And Father, we pray for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering in this season, that it would be a success in this 175th year of the IMB, so that it would fuel more and more gospel work all throughout the world, and that it would reach to the farthest corners of this earth. And Lord, that our church would joyfully participate and give with much gladness for gospel ministry and to support SBC missionaries. Father, we also want to pray just for our church, Living Rock Church Pasadena. We pray for our students as they get closer to finishing this most unusual of school semesters. Father, we pray for all of our students, whether they are in pre-K, kindergarten, all the way to college students or grad students, that they would focus to finish well this semester, that, they would, that you would just continue to grant them patience as they study and prepare for their finals. And Lord God, for those students who live at home with their parents, that they would honor their parents well and be gospel examples to their classmates. And that all of our students would grow to believe in Christ and to enjoy Jesus more. And that they would see anew the wonders of this Christmas and Advent season being more than just receiving presents from their parents. Father, we also want to pray for our church members to enjoy the responsibility and the privilege of being a covenant member of this local church family. Father, it is an immense privilege that we are members of this church and that we would obey Jesus' command in John 13, 34, 35 to love one another. Lord God, that we would demonstrate the supernatural power of the gospel of grace by how we speak and interact with one another and that we would be a Holy Spirit-infused community that preaches and lives out grace rather than performance or social status, and that we would be about the gospel more than traditions, more than cultures, and more than our own personal preferences. And Father, at this time, we are now turning to the preaching of your word. We ask that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts that are open and ready to respond to your word. Oh, Holy Spirit, give us illumination. And Spirit, help me that I would be faithful to the word and submissive to the word for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's in his beautiful name that we all pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. All right. Merry Christmas to you all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I mean, we are in December, so we can say Merry Christmas now. So uh, if you have a Bible and I pray that you do, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. <coughs> Matthew 1. Um, so, and if you don't have an access to a Bible, please uh, grab one or just... Those that are next to you uh, within your family, look on together. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, so I just got to say something to those of us uh, who are watching online. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, Matthew is the first book of what's called the New Testament. So the Bible is broken up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Matthew is the very first book of what's called the New Testament. And the big numbers are called chapters and the smaller numbers are called verses. So today we're going to be in chapter 1 verses 1 through 17. So the first 17 verses, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, Matthew 1. And uh, before we read today's verses, uh, on behalf of our elders and deacons, I'm going to share a couple of announcements. So first announcement is, as I mentioned last week, uh, our church will again be participating in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And as a short promo on the Lottie Moon offering, um, I'd like for us to watch this, think about one minute video on giving to the IMB. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there. Now we can see the multitudes. 
we are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. All right, so we as a church have the immense privilege to contribute to the work of our brothers and sisters within our denominational family for the cause of the gospel. And this year, the goal is actually $175 million to be raised, which is, which if met would be the highest amount ever given through the Lottie Moon offering. The current record is about 157, 58 million. And so the goal, the reason why for 175 is that this year is the 175th anniversary of the International Mission Board. And so that's why this target has been set. Yes, it's, it is a pandemic year. People have lost jobs. And yet, by faith, uh, all Southern Baptist churches are, ask, are being asked to give. And what, uh, you probably can't really see it. So what does our money go towards? Well, I'll just give a couple examples. It says here, $50. $50 provides language learning supplies to help prepare missionaries to begin their journey well. So missionaries, when they go out to the field, they need to learn the local language, so $50 helps to provide that. And it says here, $300 renews a missionary doctor's professional license in country that they're in. So all of us can give to contribute. And so in two Sundays, uh, on, in addition to our regular tithes and offerings, uh, if, you, if you're writing a check, just make a note, uh, Lottie Moon Christmas Offering or LMCO, and all the money is collected by our church members. We will then pass it on to the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention to support brothers and sisters all throughout the world. And so uh, just please prayerfully consider how much you'd like to give. Uh, next announcement is that in two Sundays, so Christmas Sunday, we are planning to have a Christmas lunch. So you can mark your date. So right after the Sunday worship service. Now, I have to give a caveat in that because of all the new COVID cases, uh, we might have to adjust it or maybe not even have it. So that it'll be TBA. But for now, uh, just a mark down on your calendars. We're going to have a Christmas lunch in two Sundays. And uh, the elders and deacons, we will give more information on whether we will proceed with that. And that leads to the third announcement is that on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we are planning to have Christmas Eve worship together. Uh, the exact time is TBA. And also we'll give more information on that with regards to just the current season that we're in with uh, the coronavirus still going on. And so, uh, but just for now, just write down on your calendars that we're going to have a Christmas Eve worship gathering. Now, our last and final announcement is that we are continuing today in the current sermon series called On Advent, Christ is With Us. And if you were with us last week, you remember that we looked at Isaiah chapter 9 and we saw that God's people can rejoice out of the darkness. And the most important reason that we can rejoice as God's people is because God has given us His Son, Jesus Christ. He's given us His Son, and without Christ, there is no true, lasting peace, hope, and joy for our world. And without eternal hope and without eternal joy, life really isn't worth living. Now, last weekend, as some of you know, I flew in, uh, uh, and I went to Texas and I, for Thanksgiving, and I came back for last Sunday, and I actually flew into Bob Hope Airport in Burbank. So it's my first time ever to be at Burbank Airport, and I get out and, oh, there, we walk out the plane and you walk into the airport. And I decided, you know, I didn't want to bother anyone to give me a ride, so I just, you know, fired up my Lyft app and hired a Lyft driver to give me a ride back home. And on the ride, my driver, named Tabitha, asked me what I did for work. So what was my answer? Well, I said, I, yeah, I said, I said I was a pastor. I was thinking, should I say something else? I'm a teacher or something. I said, okay, I'm a pastor. And how did she respond? 
Well, she just stared at me. She's driving, I'm in the back. She stares at me through the rear view mirror and just was shock. Why? Well, she then said, you're too young to be a pastor. You look too young. Aren't you in your 20s? I was like, well, thank you, but you're going to have to go up another decade or so. And, uh, well, since she, she found out I'm a pastor and I told her I'm a pastor, what, what did I do next? Well, I just asked her, hey, do you go to church? Do you have any religious background? Well, and then she began to share with me how she started attending church recently, about a couple years ago, because she was in a dark season of her life, being a single mom, and that a friend invited her to church, and she started going to church, and she just started sharing how Jesus had really given her hope and joy to the point, even though we are in a pandemic, and she's driving with Lyft because she needs to provide for her son as a single mom, she was saying, you know, God has been really, really gracious to me. And she said before that, in this season of death, she had not known Jesus, she would still be in the dumps. Now, since she's not a member of her church, the church that she's been attending, I actually then invite, hey, you know, come on, you can come on out here to Pasadena and uh, Living Rock Church or watch online. So I don't know if she's been watching online or has she seen online. And then when she dropped me off, I, I prayed for her, right? And I mean, that was such an encouraging thing to one another. And, and so hope and joy are really beautiful and powerful things to a lost and a dark world. And that's what the advent of Jesus Christ brings. That's what it brings. And every Christian, I think, can say amen to that. Amen? All right. So I'm assuming we're at Matthew 1 now. So let's stand for the reading of God's Word, if you're physically able. Um, and so I will read for us the first 17 verses of Matthew Chapter 1, the Apostle Matthew, one of the first followers of Jesus Christ, as inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, third person of the Trinity, wrote these words that we are reading today. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Bayud, and Abayud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Methan, and Methan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. <coughs> now, after reading these verses, I'm thinking some of us might be having these thoughts. What did we just read? All right, what in the world is this? I mean, why does the New Testament start with a bunch of names in a genealogy? I mean, is this some 23andMe thing? You know what that is? Now, if we're honest, we're on church, there are probably times we skim over sections like these in the Bible and other genealogies in the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
because it can be a bit weird, right, to do your personal reading and devotional and prayer time over verses with a bunch of lists of names that are hard to focus and like, who are these guys? I don't know who they are. So you wonder, eh, I don't know if I want to read these verses for my uh, quiet time. I'm going to read something else. But <laughs> if you're looking for baby names, this is a great place to start. So Brian watching and Nini here, you know, Uriah is listed here, right? Uriah, right? Uh, so yeah, and if you want to switch out names, you know, you can pick another name like Jehoshaphat, right? According to Dan Paul. So I think that's, what, that's his choice. So okay, you name that for your first, first son, all right? Dan Paul, Jehoshaphat, all right. Now, most of us are not really into genealogies, especially if it's about some other person. But how many of us actually know who our great-grandparents were or are, right? If that's you, Rachel, you like had a personal relationship, you personally knew on some level your great-grandparent. There might be a small number of us. I mean, even for myself, the only time I, that I met my great-grandparents was when I saw their tomb in Korea. The only time. So then why would Matthew, the Apostle Matthew, begin with a genealogy of Jesus? Well, genealogies in the Bible are more than just a list of names that we can't pronounce. I mean, every part of the Bible is there for a specific reason, so we got to understand what that is. So this morning, we're going to see three truths from this genealogy of Jesus, and then we're going to summarize these verses with one final main point. So here's truth number one, and it's this. Jesus' family tree is the true story of the Bible. All right, verse one. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. <coughs> now, most fictional stories, right? Because I'm sure we've all read fictional stories before. Most fictional stories begin with a special phrase. You know, once upon a time, blah, 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 blah. Or once there was a blah, 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 blah. Or a more famous one would be this. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And fade out. All right, what was I singing? Star Wars. Star Wars. And now my wife is embarrassed about me. <laughs> now, does Matthew begin his book in this way, like the typical fictional account? No, he starts with what? He says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus. So this is his way of saying, hey, folks, this is true. This is history. This is not fake. So what makes Christianity and Christmas true is that it is actual, true history. Right? Christianity isn't a bunch of fairy tales like the Frozen animated films, Frozen 1 or N2, and they'll probably make a 3, or, the, or myths like Greek mythology gods. Okay? That's not what Christianity is. Christianity isn't a fiction like Star Wars or Harry Potter or the Elf movie. Christianity isn't fundamentally a bunch of religious teachings like Confucianism or Buddhism or some other ism. But Christianity is real life history and it's a true story. And really Christmas doesn't work, Christ Christianity doesn't work if Jesus wasn't born as a human baby boy. I mean, and Christianity basically crumbles down to nothing if Jesus didn't live, if he didn't die on a cross, and he didn't rise from the dead. Those are all true historical factual facts. And the core foundation of Christianity isn't what Jesus taught us, 
The core foundation is what Jesus did for us. Does that make sense? Now, of course, Jesus gave lots of teachings that we need to obey and follow, right? We just go to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's, that's a sermon, the greatest sermon ever preached. But what Jesus taught has no meaning at all, no oomph in our lives, if he didn't do what he did. History is absolutely necessary. And because Christianity is based on a true story, the gospel isn't some good advice. The gospel is good news. And really the word gospel in the original Greek, because the New Testament is written in Greek, gospel literally means good news. So the gospel of Jesus Christ, beginning with the genealogy here, Jesus' genealogy means the good news of Christianity is the true story of the entire Bible. And it means there's true joy available to everyone out of the darkness that we see and experience in our lives and in this world. There's a light. And this gospel is the good news that Jesus is more than just some religious teacher. He's better than that. Now, every single belief system, including atheism, including secularism, has teachings. And every teaching has good advice. So, for example, many belief systems say this, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And many would say, don't steal, don't lie, don't murder. And others would say, do good and help others. You don't have to be a Christian to agree with that. But if Christianity was just good advice, then following Jesus would be a pointless, pointless endeavor and an utter waste of time. I mean, there would be no lasting joy and hope. C.S. Lewis, the guy who created the Chronicles of Narnia, writes this in his book, Mere Christianity. It'll be on the screen. There has been no lack of good advice for the last 4,000 years. A bit more would not have made a difference. We never have followed the advice of the great teachers. Why would we be likely to begin now? Why would we be more likely to follow Christ than any of the others? Because he is the best moral teacher? That makes it even less likely that we shall follow him. If we cannot take the elementary lessons, is it likely we are going to take the most advanced ones? If Christianity only means one more bit of good advice, then Christianity is of no importance. So Christianity, Christmas, Jesus, they only make sense when the gospel is good news, when the gospel is true, and when the gospel is real. And what's this real story from the Bible found here in Matthew 1? Well, in the very first verse of the New Testament, we see a summary of the entire Old Testament. Now, if we look at verse 1 here of Matthew 1, who are the names that are listed? We have Jesus, we have David, and we have Abraham. Three names. And then when we go to the last verse, verse 17 of today's passage, we see the same names. Verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Christ referring to, obviously, Jesus. Now, 14 here isn't a, some random number that Matthew just put in. Uh, to make things easy and simple to, to do math. Remember, genealogies in the Bible are not just some random writings. Okay? There is a theological, historical, and literary purpose from Matthew here. And the focus from this list of names first centers on Abraham found in verses 2 through 6. So here's a question. Who was Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Now my wife is even more embarrassed. 
Okay, so Abraham is the father of the three major monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. And the truth is that Jesus is ethnically descended from Abraham as a Jew. This is what God says in Genesis 12 to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God promised that he would bless the entire world through Father Abe. And Jesus is the final answer of this promise to bless the entire world. So, and then after Abraham, the story then centers on David found in verses 6 through 11. All right, so who was David? Well, David was the greatest king in the Old Testament, and he is the standard by which all other kings, by whom all other kings are measured against. And really, if there was a King David song, I would sing it for you, but I don't know of one. And so Jesus is royally descended from David as the true king. 2 Samuel 7, what Joel led us in reciting earlier, says this, 7:12. When your days are fulfilled, God speaking to David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So God promised King Dave that he would have a forever offspring that would sit on the eternal throne. And Jesus is the final answer of this promise of an everlasting kingdom. But there's one more central person from the Old Testament. Now, he's not named in verse 1, but he's actually referenced. Anyone want to take a guess? Here's what Genesis 5.1 says. This is the book of the generations, okay, another word for genealogy, of Adam. When God created man, he made him, Adam, in the likeness of Adam. And then here's what Luke says when he writes at the beginning and the end of his genealogy of Jesus, Luke 3. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Jesus is the Savior King who has come from Adam, who's come from Abraham, who's come from David. And he's here now as the better son, the better savior, and the better king. And the question now for every single one of us here and watching online is whether I believe this is the true story of good news or this is some make-believe fantasy stuff full of only good advice. Now friends, if I only follow the moral teachings of Jesus, I am not a Christian. Even if I know all the teachings and I keep them better than many other people, that doesn't equal salvation and true joy. Because the gospel good news of Christianity is receiving and believing and tasting and seeing in Jesus as the Savior king. And he alone, he alone gives the gifts of salvation, the gifts of the deepest joys possible in this life, and the gift of the most wonderful purpose for why we exist. And not only is this family tree of Jesus a true story, here's a second truth. Jesus' family tree is radically inclusive. His genealogy is radically inclusive. Now, for Jews back then, and Jews even today, a genealogy was like a resume. 
So think in, in the context of a resume. So your family tree showed your worth and showed your value and showed your prestige. And so if you wanted to look awesome and look good in front of others and not be as embarrassed, what would you do? Well, what some people would do is they would start twisting their genealogy by eliminating the bad ancestors. Uh, I don't know this guy, let's remove his name. And they would just keep the good ones. So they would, it would look good to everybody. They would just show off their family resume. Now, isn't it surprising that even today, some people actually still do that with their resumes? They kind of fudge it up a little bit so that when they hand it to a potential employer, they look better than they actually are? So, so that's the context here. So if a person's family tree had issues, that would be considered shameful. And even in our modern world, even today, I'm pretty sure thinking that most of us don't feel too comfortable talking about a bad or an evil ancestor. I doubt anybody out there says, hey, I'm related to Hitler. Yeah. No, we'd be thinking, oh, okay. <laughs> so I doubt that, that we're going to be bragging that we're descended from some criminal or notorious individual. But if I'm related to a rich or a famous person, oh, yeah, hey, um, find that person, take a picture, put it on Facebook, Instagram, email it to everybody, show my friends, put it at home. Right? I'm going to brag about this famous and rich person that I know I'm related to. Okay, so how does the family resume look for Jesus in Matthew 1? Well, women are mentioned. In fact, there are five ladies that are named here. Why is that a big deal? Well, in those days, Women, ladies, okay, so I'm just speaking, just giving you historical context, ladies. Ladies were considered second-class citizens. And females were not considered valuable enough to be even mentioned in genealogies. Right, just, just list the sons, don't list the daughters. And yet, in the family tree of Jesus we see here, we have female ancestors that are named. So we got who? Tamar in verse 3, Rahab and Ruth are in verse 5, Bathsheba is in verse 6, and Mary is named in verse 16. Now, I've actually had people tell me that the Bible is sexist against ladies. So I just want to say to that, that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, women are honored and highly valued in the Bible, starting with Genesis 1, made in the image of God, and here in Matthew 1. And Jesus, the Savior King, has a family tree that is radically inclusive of both females and males. And here's what's also amazing about all these ladies here in Matthew 1. All of them were involved in suspicious situations in giving birth to their sons. And for some of Jesus' female ancestors, they endured such utter wickedness and depravity from men. Now, for example, in Genesis 38, Tamar gives birth to twin sons. And who was the birth dad in Genesis 38? Well, it was Judah, her father-in-law. So he took advantage of her, and then he shunned her as an outcast. That's in the Bible. Joshua 2, Joshua 6, described Rahab as a prostitute, which means that numerous men took advantage of her because she needed money, and she was viewed as dirty by society. Nobody brags about being a prostitute. Ruth, we read in Ruth, Ruth experienced an unusual courtship with Boaz, and, so, and then she was shunned by many others because she was a foreigner. And Bathsheba, in verse 6, is called the wife of Uriah. So why this phrase? Why not put her name in there? Well, because Matthew wants us to remember her story. In 2 Samuel 11, it tells us that David uses his authority as the king to take advantage of Bathsheba. He sleeps with her. 
And then to make it even worse, David then murders her husband to cover up his adultery. It's all in the Bible, right? The Bible is not PG. So he murders, David murders his close friend Uriah because he doesn't want his friend to know what he just did to his friend's wife. And this is the same David that the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. And then when we get to Mary, the circumstances of her pregnancy are kind of fishy as well, right? But we'll talk about Mary next week. So you know what's crazy amazing about all this? God, in his grace, he chose to use these ladies in bringing Jesus to us. So the family tree of Jesus includes ladies who've been wronged, who've been abused, and who've been shamed by others. Now, I need to say this because we live in a Genesis 3 world, just, just evil. And I have to say this, so I'm just going to look at the screen. Sister, lady friend, if you are right now in an abusive situation, please get help. Please get help. Please contact the elders and deacons of this church, and we will go to bat for you. Amen, elders and deacons? Please get help. And if you don't feel comfortable contacting the church, then it's on the screen. Please contact the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. Please call. All right, you do not have to endure your abuse, the darkness that you're in, alone. There is no shame in that. And asking for help, please do not do nothing. Because, sister, God has not forgotten about you. Because he lavished his loving grace upon these ladies in Jesus' family tree. These Old Testament ladies who've been abused by men. And so he can do the same for you. So please go to Jesus. Please get help. I had to say that. But not only do gender outsiders and moral outsiders belong in Jesus' family tree, ethnic outsiders belong in Jesus' family as well. Now, did you know that Jesus is not 100% genetically a Jew? He is Jewish, but he's not 100%. How do we know this fact? Well, Tamar and Rahab were Canaanites. Ruth was a Moabite. And Bathsheba's first husband, Uriah, is Uriah the Hittite, which probably means that she was a non-Jew as well. Now, why is it important that some of Jesus' ancestors were not Jewish? Because Jesus came to save both Jews and Gentiles. And unless I am terribly wrong, we don't have any Jewish members in our church family. And well, for, I know for a fact that I am not a Jew. I'm pretty sure of it. So Jesus as the Savior King, he is the Savior King who came to save people from all different types of backgrounds. He's here to redeem and to ransom and to reconcile and to give joy to anyone and everyone who trusts in him. There is no ethnic or language test to being a follower of Jesus. There is no litmus test whether you've been morally pure your whole life. So if you reach a certain level, then yeah, you can become a Christian. There is none of that. No, Jesus invites all, source, all different sorts and kinds of people to be in his family because he came from a family filled with all sorts of men and women. And because his family tree is so radically inclusive, available to anyone and everyone, some of Jesus' even his first followers were outcasts as well. Mark 2.14 says this, And he, as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. 
And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So who's this Levi the tax collector? All right, who's this guy who's shunned by the religious leaders and basically crapped on as a sinner? Who's Levi? Well, he's also known as Matthew, the guy who wrote this genealogy. And Jesus saved Matthew to be a follower. Isn't that amazing? So friends, it, this means that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, there is room in the family of Jesus. Maybe you feel that you're an outcast, or you're just some outsider, or you feel that you're worthless in this world and no one has given you the time of the day. But Jesus looks at you and he says, I gave my own life to save you, sinner. I am the great physician and the Savior King who's here to heal your spiritual sickness and to give you joy. And Jesus says to us that his family tree is just the beginning. And like with Matthew, Jesus then tells all of us to follow him because he plans to adopt us into his family. Consider these words written by the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention, so our denomination. It says this, Pastor J.D. Greer says, this is all supposed to be sending you a message. Jesus came for the outcast. He was not ashamed to identify with the outcast as their brother and make them part of his family. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way. He would take upon himself the iniquity of us all. So Abraham and King David are mentioned in the same list as the prostitute Rahab, because in Jesus Christ, prostitute and king sit down as So no matter our histories, our backgrounds, our current circumstances, Jesus is ready, even right now, to work in and through our lives to bring out the good, the true, and the beautiful. And on the cross, Jesus took the cancer of all of our sins, past, present, and future, and he gave us the joyful perfection of his perfect life. And this leads to the third and the final truth today. Jesus' family tree shows God's faithfulness to sinners. His family tree shows his faithfulness to sinners. Now, if we take the Ten Commandments, okay, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, take them out, and we just kind of lay it over Matthew 1 here on this genealogy, we are going to see some big problems. Okay, we look at Abraham. Abraham was a what? He was a liar, and he was an adulterer. He lied twice, saying that his wife Sarah was his sister. Twice. And because of his lie, she almost became a prostitute. Okay, good job. And then Abraham also slept, had a son with Hagar, who was Sarah's servant. And so since then, the whole Jew versus Muslim thing in terms of who is the true father of the Jews and Muslims and all that stuff, that fight started with Abraham's adultery. And then we go on. Jacob, Jacob did what? He cheated his brother. He cheated his father for the firstborn blessings. And then Judah, Judah took advantage of Tamar, his daughter-in-law, after he mistreated her as his daughter-in-law. And he thought that she was actually a prostitute Okay? And then he had two sons with her. And then when he found out that she was pregnant, before he realized that he was the father, he wanted to have her executed. Okay, then when we go to what? David. David basically, okay, just to be a little blunt here, maybe you might want to cover the kid's ears, David basically rapes Bathsheba. And then he has his friend Uriah murdered during an army battle. 
And then after Uriah is killed, David takes Bathsheba as another wife. Okay, and then David's son Solomon isn't that much better. How many wives does Solomon have? 300 wives. And then 700 concubines. So if we go up and down this list in Matthew 1, there's a ton of wickedness, evil, chaos, pain. And all of that screams out what? A three-letter word, S-I-N, sin. That's what it screams out. But you know what's absurd and awesome at the same time? God was constantly faithful to every single sinner. He was working in and through the dysfunction and the suffering. He was keeping his promises even though nobody deserved his blessings. He kept his promise. Did Abraham and David earn blessings from God? No way. They both did terrible things. They hurt their families, but God was still faithful. He was showing his amazing grace and his unfailing love. Last year, I actually read a brief testimony from a man named Thomas Terrence. And this man grew up in a Baptist church, and he was baptized at the age of 13. So he was saved, right? Sadly, no. Well, how do I know that? <clears throat> well, he says in his testimony that as a young adult growing up in the 1960s in the South, he got caught up in all the anti-Semitic and racist kind of thoughts of that day. And this hateful racism got so bad that Mr. Terrence attempted to bomb the house of a Jewish businessman with a fellow accomplice. Now, sadly for them, uh, the SWAT team was ready had found out about this, so it was ready for them, and they got into a shootout, and so the fellow criminal was shot and killed, and then Mr. Terrence, at close range, was shot four times with a shotgun. So they take him to the hospital, the doctors tell him, you have 45 minutes to live. Get ready. But God mercifully spared his life. Okay, so Mr. Terrence repented and believed in Jesus, right? Sadly, no. Six months later, he escapes from prison with two fellow inmates. And then two days later, after that, the FBI finds them. They go into another shootout, and one of his fellow inmates is shot and killed. So he's arrested again, and this time, they put him into solitary confinement. And now, because he's alone with nobody to talk to, he decides, I'm going to just try to read. So he starts try, trying to read every single racist and anti-Semitic literature out there that he can get his hands on. But then, as he's reading all those things, he starts reading things about philosophy. And then while he's reading things about philosophy, he comes across the Bible, and he starts to read the Bible. And while reading the Gospels, his eyes were opened, and he believed. So he repented of his sins, prayed for Jesus to forgive him, and he was a transformed and a new man. Now, later, he learned that while he was in jail, under solitary confinement, the wife of the FBI agent who arrested him had been leading a woman's prayer group. And for over two years, this woman's prayer group was praying for him to believe in Jesus and be saved. So a white supremacist guy who wanted to murder Jews and African Americans, a man who escaped from jail and was almost killed twice by law enforcement, was saved by Jesus. Hallelujah. And here's what this guy, Mr. Terrence, writes at the end of his short testimony. He writes this. It's, sorry, it won't be on the screen. He says, it's the same grace that's been so abundant in my life is available today to anyone who truly wants it. Simply embrace the gospel and turn to Christ in repentant faith. Now, everyone has a past. Everyone. And maybe a few of us might think that our past is so terrible that no one would want to love me. But if God showed his faithfulness to sinners in the family tree of Jesus, if he showed his faithfulness to a KKK-type guy, 
and Thomas Terrence, then surely, right, he will show his faithfulness to me and to you and to you, no matter the darkness in our lives. Now, this doesn't mean that God is pleased with your sin and my sin. It's like, oh, good job that you sinned. No. But because he is faithful and just, what Brother Joel prayed earlier, because he's faithful and just, because he works all things together for the good of his people, that's what God does, God takes the chaotic messes and screw-ups of our lives, the sins of our lives, and he takes the lemons and he makes lemonade. And this leads to the main point of today's sermon. So if you're going to remember just one thing from today, remember this. Jesus is the Savior King who is here. Jesus is the Savior King who is here. Verse 16, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So Jesus was born of Mary into this world. I mean, that he is the promised Savior for all humanity, for every single person. That is awesome, blossom, good news. Amen? Man, that is good news. And you know what? Nobody, no one is beyond the saving grace of God. None of us here can out the coverage of his grace and his mercy. And so the beauty of Jesus coming into our world is that he brings the offer of peace, hope, love, and joy to everybody. That's the promise of Christmas. That's why he's called Christ in verse 16. Right? Christ is not his last name, first name Jesus, last name Christ. No, Christ is his title. It literally means the anointed one. And what was Jesus anointed and chosen to do? He came to be the Savior. He came to save every person who believes and trusts in him. So the issue isn't about my background or your background. It's about faith and knowing Christ. So the gospel is for everyone who will turn to Jesus. Here's what Galatians 4 says. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, friends, Christmas isn't the complete full story of Christianity. Advent is just about, isn't just about Jesus coming as a human baby boy. It's also about his second coming, his final return. That's what this season is about. And so, really, the main point can actually be updated. We can go to the next slide. Jesus is the Savior King who is here, and he will return. He will return. Now, why is that so important? Why should I care? Well, the gospel declares that the birth of Jesus Christ marks a new era of human history. Jesus coming into this world changed everything. And God becoming a human was such a mind-blowing event. And the beauty of the gospel message is that God is faithful even when we are faithless. Jesus is the Savior for the world. He arrived once, and he will return again. And Jesus was born to die for sinners like us. And through his death for our sins and his glorious resurrection, he offers to every single person eternal life, everlasting joy, and forgiveness. So the hope of Christmas is that true joy and authentic living comes from the Savior King who was born. Listen to these words written by a New Testament professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He says this, Patrick Schreiner, Matthew's genealogy has a past, a present, and future. In Jesus Christ, we're now brought into this family. Abraham and David become our fathers. It becomes our genealogy, our family tree. Though this world seeks historical rooting and future life in various ways, only one child establishes the new creation. Jesus is the point of this genealogy, for Jesus is the point of the Bible. 
Okay, so what's the proper response to Jesus, the Savior, King, who's here? Well, if I'm a Christian, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, if I'm his disciple, then Jesus has given all of us a mission. And it's actually the greatest of commissions. And Matthew gives it to us at the end of his book, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So sisters and brothers, Jesus the Savior King tells us to make disciples out of all nations. We go, we tell, and we teach that He is the Savior. We announce that He is the King of kings. And we call others to repent of their sins and to believe in Christ, and we disciple others to do the same. And just to be clear, because sometimes we get confused, evangelism is a part of discipleship. They are not distinct and separate things. So, making disciples who make disciples is actually the goal. Evangelism is the means to the goal. Now, maybe you aren't a Christian here this morning, watching online. Maybe this whole Christianity and Christmas thing is just plain weird to you. So, I just want to ask you, friend, I mean, what are you expecting this Christmas? I mean, what are your hopes? What are you anticipating in this season? I mean, is it the end of a school semester? Graduation? Are you hoping for a nice paying job? Future marriage? Retirement? Vacation, if you can get out of the stay-at-home orders? Are you hoping in the American dream, which is basically a lie? What do you bank your life on that will last beyond your own lifetime and is best for all humanity? And here's something for all of us to think about as we close. This season, maybe for a few of us, isn't the most wonderful time of the year. Maybe for some of us, we don't really like and enjoy this holiday season. Why? Because there's tragedy, death, and bad stuff happens or maybe something has happened in the past. And so for some of us, maybe in this season, it's not always joyful and happy. We hate the Hallmark Channel with all that stuff it says. And if anything, this pandemic is screaming at all of us as a reminder that this world is broken and it is bent out of shape. And really what will keep each of us and our church family going is that Jesus is the promised Savior King who brings hope and peace to our world. And no matter the pain, the suffering, the ugliness, the hurt, Jesus is here. And he doesn't abandon his people. Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your word is good, because you, Lord, are good and faithful and just to us. Father, who are we to even approach you, a holy and righteous God, even though we are sinners who sin every day against each other and especially against you. And yet, Lord, we know as a fact that Jesus was sent into this world as our Savior King. He is here today with us, and we know and believe that one day soon that he will return and that every tear of sorrow and suffering and pain and evil and tragedy will one day be wiped away from our faces because you promised that for us. And we know that your promise, Lord, is true because Christ has come once. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose again. And he will one day again come. 
And what we believe by faith, we will see in sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Today being the first Sunday of the month, uh, as what we do in our church family is we uh, partake in the Lord's Supper together. And so I'm going to read to start off from Matthew chapter 26. You can turn there if you'd like in your own Bible, so just listen along as I read it for us. Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, and it says this. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread And after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you, my Father's kingdom. So the Lord's Supper is a remembrance and a celebration. We remember and celebrate the past, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We remember and celebrate even today, that though we still fall short, through faith in what Jesus has done for us, we are saved, redeemed, forgiven. And the Lord's Supper also helps us to look forward to the future, that one day soon, that Jesus will come back and we will have the greatest and most enjoyable of suppers with him face to face. That's what this symbolizes. Before we take these uh, elements together, I just have to say a few more words. Now, if you are not a Christian, do not consider yourself a Jesus follower, or maybe you're wondering if you are a Christian. Uh, On behalf of this church family, I would like to ask that you refrain from taking these elements. Uh, And we ask this not because we're trying to be a jerk to you, but um, because if you're not a Christian, this really has no significance to you. And this is just grape juice and a little wafer. There is no magical powers by taking this. So uh, this is just symbolic. So we ask that you would just respectfully refrain if you are not a, uh, a believer, a Christian who's actually baptized in good standing with your local church. So you have to work that out between yourself and the Lord. But for the rest of us, we are believe, uh, as believers in Christ, we can take this together. So let's, before we take the elements, just uh, give us about 30 seconds to a minute just to pray and to contemplate and to remember. And this is your moment and opportunity to do business with the Lord, to repent and confess of any sins that you need to confess and repent, and also to thank Him and to praise Him for His salvation. So give us a few moments, and then uh, we'll take the elements together. Brothers and sisters, let's uh, hold up the wafer together. Um, This bread symbolizes 
the body of Christ who was broken for us on the cross. And he says to us, take and eat. Now let's hold the cup up together. This cup represents the blood of the new covenant given to us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins, all of our past sins, all of our present sins, even all of the sins that we will commit in the future on the cross. Jesus paid for that 100% total. So let's take together and remember and celebrate. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember the supper, that the body and blood of Christ was broken and shed for us on the cross to give us forgiveness and eternal life. And we believe in faith that this is true and real, and this is the greatest hope for everyone in this world. Lord, thank you. And remind us again of your beauty and awesomeness to us. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray.
Thank you for joining in this Sunday morning worship gathering of Living Rock Church Pasadena here and also online. And as we close, let's stand together for a closing prayer and a final scripture reading from Revelation 22. Lord God, we thank you and praise you that Christ has come and he will come again, that we could sing and join with the angels that salvation is here. And Father, as we go forward this week, whether it be with school or work or hanging out at the beach or wherever we may be, at the grocery store, that we would proclaim Christ through our words and actions and give glory to you and to know that we can have the deepest possible joys in this life because Jesus loves us. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. And every believer says, Amen. Have a blessed and wonderful week in Christ. Thank you.